some citizenship and, um, and, the, and as a European citizen. Uh, I was surprised and somewhat unsettled uh, a few months ago when I read a long uh, report published by a French organization which is uh, called, named the Centre de Prevention contre le Derby de Sectaire lié à l'Islam. It is an association whose main purpose is to offer counseling to families and educators concerned by the so-called processes of radicalization uh, under, uh, undertaken by young people, mm, their, generally their sons or their students. And for the most part, we're talking about people between their 15, 15 years old and 21 years old. Uh, the most striking part of this report for me was not just reading of the hundreds of cases they faced, which included a, a significant number of boys and girls moving to Syria or to Iraq to answer the call of the caliphate. The most striking part for me was reading the statistics about the background of these young Europeans who became extremists. 90% of them uh, comes from families that have been living in France for more than two generations. 85% of them come from middle to high income families. And the vast majority also comes from families that have no religious affiliation. Now, it is clear, of course, these numbers are always subject to interpretation, and this, this is certainly a partial sample of the phenomenon. But I think it is still significant. It seems quite clear to me that given this kind of reality, that the ordinary factors that commenters and politicians and even academics generally refer to while trying to make sense of this phenomenon, elements like immigration, poverty, or religious uh, traditionalism are insufficient to draw the whole pictures uh, of something which is, can arguably be seen as a failure of European citizenship. It is always troubling to consider the level of dissonance and manipulation that shapes the self-understanding of people who at some point radically estrange themselves uh, from the civic texture of their own societies, which are also our own societies. Uh, we cannot but wonder what went wrong when we ponder that the London bombers of July 2005 or the Charlie Hebdo assassins of 2015 were in fact during their everyday life students, workers, and sometimes quite decent member of their metropolitan neighborhood, or at least they were perceived as such. For the most part, they were born in that country, they were raised in that, in that country, they were educated in that country. Obviously, this kind of story is quite complex, and every serious assessment of it has to include multiple elements. But it doesn't seem far-fetched to suggest that what's going on there and what should be done about it falls within the realm of understanding that is typically associated with the humanities at least as much, if not more, within the charts of political economists or the reports of security experts or the scope of law and jurisprudence. In public discourse, though, curiously enough, we constantly hear about the latter, but we rarely hear about the former. And in, in this sense, I, I mean, I, I, mean, I entirely agree with the statement that was made this morning that the grand arguments are coming back. And it is particularly significant that these facts happened in the very same countries where uh, until 20 or uh, uh, 30 years ago we declared the end of the grand narratives. <laughs> they are coming back and quite loudly, apparently. <coughs> My point is that in dealing with the striking impasse of citizenship, and particularly of European citizenship, that the most recent events keep reminding us, tragically, we must really consider to shift the attention from questions about norms, regulations, and programs to the conditions that allow a person, every person, as it, as it should be in a democracy, to make sense of those norms, regulations, and programs in the first place. It is a requirement of democracy, at least, if we stand to what democratic theory affirms, that every 
single person should be at least able to access to the reasons and to make sense of the reasons that justify the norms, the regulations, and the programs he is subject to. So it is not a problem of humanists. It should be a problem, really a problem of democratic citizenship, what it is about. Which capabilities are required to read reflexively one's own sense of identity and agency in relation to the requirements that, that come from membership in democratic and pluralistic societies? Which tools are needed for a person to be able to articulate her own ethical place and civic role within a globalized and sometimes hostile setting? How many viable ways are uh, there to separate what is private and what is public, what is individual and what is collective, what is personal narrative and what is a shared discourse? Because generally it's, it's, it's a short circuit between these distinctions that brings to estrangement and total uh, lack of recognition of being a member of uh, this society. And these questions are much less obvious than regulators all, uh, generally think they are. They generally rely uh, on the idea that there's some kind of large and common understanding of how these distinctions are drawn, but there's actually not even there, <laughs> generally. Uh, as, I mean, the examples are many, uh, but are interesting. I mean, wearing religious symbols on one's own body, uh, I mean, is an individual or a collective matter. What you eat, uh, what you ingest, it's, it's something that is actually public or private. Uh, because uh, it, it is private in a sense, but it's clearly also very often a, a public issue. And so on. I mean, the example in healthcare, in this sense, is, is a striking example. I mean, what you do to my body, being cured with public money, but it's something that you're doing to me. It is very intimate, in a sense. I mean, there's no way to make policy about that and to be citizens that, uh, in a sense, are passive, but are also in a democratic state going to be active about this issue. You cannot understand these kind of issues, just standing by the rules. <coughs> you have to question the set of understandings that are beyond and uh, behind these rules. Now, there's hardly any sense of one's own citizenship without a certain critical understanding of one's own place within a texture of historical events, traditional texts, and normative ideals. Any attempt to reduce the condition of being a citizen to a mere legal status that enables our participation in a set of democratic procedures uh, dangerously erodes the preconditions that are needed to actually willingly and consciously participate to those procedures and rules in the first place. Only some kind of reflective awareness of one's own place within a public square, with its history of struggles, with its paradigmatic representations and linguistic repertoires can enable an enduring conversation, can enable a, the participation that actually defines what democratic citizenship is about. It is the kind of historical and effective awareness that brings to the understanding of how the civil conversation, the idea of the uh, uh, civil conversation, the conversation civile, with others, is already in some way internal to one's own beliefs as different as they may appear from beliefs of others. There is not public conversation and deliberation if not grounded over the awareness of the conversation that shape our own ideas, feelings, and traditions. And this is generally what humanities are about, to investigate this kind of internal conversation that shape what we are and what it has become of us and what makes our belongings. This is not, uh, and I want to stress this, a kind of awareness that requires the shift from a different point of view. It does not call for a homogenization or westernization of people's views. I am clearly not advocating for this. But it rather calls for a reflective reconsideration of the essentially social, cooperative, and historical conditions of one's own point of view, whatever it is, and ask them, people, to reshape and reconsider uh, that background. Accordingly, the fact that your own self-understanding brings to 
it, it makes uh, your connection with an history, with the history of others, it, it brings it come back to life. Mm -hmm. There's no impersonal way of being a citizen, uh, entirely defined by a rationally practiced set of rights, allowances, and duties. Mm -hmm. Citizenship is always a personal matter, insofar as it calls for the articulation of what's at stake in publicly exercising our humanity as inevitably intertwined with the web of historical, conceptual, and textual connection with others. Now, uh, of course, this, uh, this issue has been raised, luckily and rightfully so, in uh, Western countries, but I want to argue that it's not just something that is about us. I think that is a global issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between humanities and democracy here is a global issue. Uh, there was an interesting op-ed which came out in November on the New York Times, written by two scholars who actually uh, for some time were, were teaching in Saudi Arabia. Huh? But if you ask people who are into Islamic studies, they can tell you that it's not just a problem of Saudi Arabia. Uh, where they underline how in the last 10 years in Saudi Arabia uh, there has actually been an expansion <coughs> of uh, higher studies, uh, the multiplication of universities, of programs to study abroad for young Saudis. Uh, the curricula are all just about science, engineering, medicine and economics. Mm. To quote the authors of the article, Saudi students still do not get a good grounding in history <coughs> Uh, or comparative analysis. Uh, during our years living in the kingdom, we heard that some young Saudis say that they did not know there had been a World War I or a World War II. Comparative religion, political theory, and philosophy are not taught. Indeed, for some Saudi educators, these are dangerous subjects. I think it is telling that how, despite the most popular public imaginaries, of what freedom of research and teaching is about are still, are still revolved mainly around the representation of the scientists <coughs> at work in hard science and technology. Actually, some of the most authoritarian regimes in the world uh, seem much more scared of people researching and teaching history, literature, and philosophy than they are about the mass presence of physics, biology, and economics in their curricula. The humanities are, in this sense, a matter of global democracy. Now, I argue more than ever. I come to my conclusions. Much has been written about the institutional requirements of citizenship and about the conditions of, the, of its full-fledged realization. Much is, con is constantly said in the public sphere about what we need to become uh, informed decision makers, efficient and productive workers, responsible and satisfied consumers. There is nothing wrong uh, with that, I think. Uh, but really, it does not seem that much of the essential is, but it really does seem that much of the essential is left out of the pictures. Being citizens, as Aristotle already noticed uh, quite some time ago, requires to be able both to govern and to be governed at the same time. And in complex interconnected societies, this task is possibly uh, more hard than it was in, harder than it was in the past. It requires to be able to re-elaborate our own tradition, to read historical events in their context, to understand what it means to interpret sacred and juridical texts, to rediscover ancient linguistic and symbolic repertoires, to grasp normative and descriptive distinctions, and to connect and distinguish personal narratives and public discourse. All these are typical gestures of the humanities, as we know. That is why I think to reinvent citizenship, we need to reinvent the humanities as well. As Dante Alighieri stated in the De Monarchia, bonus homo et civis bonus convertuntur. Truly, there's no chance to be good citizens when humans do not strive for some good understanding of themselves as historical, social, poetic, speculative, and spiritual beings. <laughs>